Good morning, and thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to welcome you today to our e-broadcast, Improve Your Collaborative Workflows and Business Outcomes. My name is Rob Arnold, and I'm an industry principal at Frost & Sullivan. I'll be both your moderator and one of today's presenters. Today's e-broadcast is designed as an interactive event between you and the presenters. We have a Q&A that you can participate in by asking questions at any time during the presentation. And to do that, you'll just need to type your question into the Q&A box at the left portion of your console, or click on the Q&A widget, and then click on Submit. You're also able to enlarge slides at any time by dragging the bottom corner of the slide window. We'll be advancing the slides automatically for you throughout the event. If you experience problems with the program, just press the F5 key on your keyboard to refresh or close and relaunch the presentation. You can visit our eBroadcast help guide by clicking help at the bottom right or simply submit a question. We'll also be posting some polling questions throughout this presentation and they'll appear in your slide area. In order to answer the poll question, please select the radio button that corresponds with your answer and click the Submit button. At the end of the e-broadcast, we'll take a look at the results. We'll also be live tweeting throughout the program using hashtag ActionableAnalytics, so please join the conversation with us on Twitter. Finally, today's program is also available on demand at frost.com forward slash collaborative workflows, so you can share your program with your colleagues. Before we get started, let's take a moment to look at today's agenda. First, I'll give a brief overview of enterprise collaboration market trends and video conferencing benefits. Then we'll hear from Joe Leeza, Senior Vice President, UCC and Service Solutions, and Tim Rick, Senior Vice President, Service Operations, both of whom are at AAVISPL. And Tim will further discuss best practices as well as customer success stories on how to improve your overall collaborative workflow. At the end of today's presentation, I'd like to ask our audience to participate in a survey that will evaluate today's program. And this survey will, again, appear in the center of your screen. With all that said, let's get started with today's e-broadcast. Briefly, I wanted to begin by uh, explaining what an industry analyst does. Uh, at Frost & Tullivan, our communications and collaboration team evaluates the uh, technology development, uh, service support, sales, adoption, and usage trends for a variety of collaboration tools, such as audio, video, web conferencing, telephony, messaging, and a range of other solutions. We offer a, a number of analytical uh, databases, including market share and forecast analysis, as well as a qualitative wrap around how trends in the market are affecting um, the adoption of those technologies. I wanted to begin today's presentation by discussing yesterday's video conferencing. Video conferencing has traditionally been implemented for tactical or practical benefits, as you can see on this slide. The main focus was really around cost cutting, travel reduction, and the ability to bring together a distributed internal team. The primary format for these types of meetings were scheduled, and they were from fixed locations, and individuals were expected to connect at predetermined times from predetermined places. And usually it was point to point. So one specific meeting room connecting directly to another specific meeting room, and it was not multi-party. For most part, this type of structured meeting inhibits the ability to integrate video conferencing into workflows. Now, more recently, there have been a number of influences that have changed the expectations for video conferencing. In the business world, solutions such as more reliable networks, higher quality, more user-friendly and admin-friendly services, as well as more powerful and capable devices, whether fixed video conferencing endpoints, mobile devices, desktops, or other. In the consumer world, these influences stem from anything from Skype to FaceTime and a number of social applications. All of these influences combined to help make video just one facet of a broader collaboration feature set that could include voice, content sharing, presence, chat, recording, and a number of other capabilities. 
As such, business collaboration technology has evolved, and so has deployment and consumption models and expectations. This flexibility has disrupted the rigid, fixed, and always scheduled traditional video conferencing model. The ability to support a much wider range of use cases and environments combined with operational deployment and consumption models has dramatically shifted enterprise purchase trends. On this slide, we see Frost & Sullivan's latest market data. And from what you can see here, the only segment of the market that is in decline is the traditional on-premise video conferencing infrastructure sector. There are a number of reasons why this is in decline. First, infrastructure components are now less expensive than they were in the past. But more importantly, more organizations are looking to outsource services and components of their collaboration solutions to trusted third parties. What we're expecting to happen in the market here is strong and stable growth in managed services, both in public and private clouds, as well as exceptional growth in adoption of video conferencing services. Interesting here also is we expect strong and stable growth in video conferencing unit endpoints. In contrast to the infrastructure market, we expect these lower cost yet more powerful devices to be deployed more extensively by organizations throughout their estates, allowing more pervasive deployment and connectivity across more sites and user groups. These shifts are also changing the expected benefits that visual collaboration can provide to an organization. More enterprise decision makers are rating strategic benefits as pivotal drivers to why they're adopting visual collaboration solutions. And they expect these solutions to have a greater impact on their business operations and workflows. For example, improving marketing effectiveness boosting innovation in R&D and other work groups within the organization, accelerate decision-making by closing the gaps between individuals to make better, more informed decisions in faster time. In order to achieve these benefits, enterprises are expecting to protect, use, and add value to their existing investments. They're looking to create solutions based on their own unique criteria, such as technology performance, scale, feature sets, price, ease of use, and more. In recognition of historical limitations, enterprise decision makers are no longer willing to accept an unintegrated environment, and a single source infrastructure may not necessarily be the best option for their requirements. It's important to look at this slide not only from an on-premises perspective, but also from a cloud perspective. And a recent IBM survey reported that 45% of enterprises will seek to keep some of their workloads on the premises as they adopt cloud technologies. Overall, whether cloud, premises, or hybrid, tightly integrated multi-vendor infrastructure is expected to rise nearly 10% two years from now. This type of environment will become even more prevalent in the mid and long terms as organizations implement their plans. Still, restraints to adoption and expansion remain. The top restraints for conferencing tools appear, at least to me, to be very much legacy. Given that yesterday's solutions were so unfriendly to users, it's easy to see how these perceptions persist. But these issues are not necessarily inherent in today's software and services-based solutions. In addition to technology itself, a range of professional, managed, integration, Outsource Cloud, and other services each address these concerns in different ways. At this time, I'd like to take a moment to allow our audience to answer our first polling question. Simply select the best answer that suits your opinion. Now I'd like to hand it over to Joe, Senior Vice President, Unified Communications, Collaboration, and Service Solutions, and Tim Rick, Senior Vice President, Service Operations, both at AVISPL. At this point, I'd like to pass it to Joe, who's in the trenches with enterprises every day, to understand their changing needs and what is being done to address them. Thanks, Rob, and hello, everyone. My name is Joe Leaza, as Rob mentioned, and I'm the Senior Vice President of UCC and Service Solutions here at AVISPL. 
ABISBL uh, provides technology services focused on collaboration solutions for the workplace. So as Rob mentioned, and the data is demonstrating, there's a noticeable shift in market trends and demands. In order to accommodate this shift, the predominant focus for collaboration solutions must become business outcome related. And with that, it really is no longer just about video conferencing. It's really about motivated employees with productive tools that may be dispersed or mobile. The result or outcome in this are things like agility, innovation, scale, among others. As for the challenges in today's environments, today they are more workplace related. And again, not just application related, it's more holistically a mobile, agile, agile and engaged workforce that is able to collaborate effectively across multiple settings. With this, standardization and support become more critical to success than ever. This comes with the need to have the right tools to support this workplace, such as collaboration applications as part of unified communication solution for that workplace. The good news is that options to achieve the proper business outcomes have become more consistent and simplified. Here at AVISPL, we're meeting the shift in workplace requirements by focusing on these business outcomes and not just those applications. For example, we employ a methodology to delivering on the proper outcomes by evaluating collaboration solutions in three areas. We look at workspace, workflow, and experience. And achieving the right outcome needs to ultimately start and end with the right user experiences. In fact, we believe that by delivering consistent and simplified solutions, the outcome ultimately takes care of itself. We generally apply this approach, for example, to introduce a simplified and standard solution to support collaborative environments across spaces such as huddle spaces, traditional conference rooms, or the sophisticated large environments such as boardrooms and learning spaces. In the end, as part of the workplace transformation objectives, enterprises are really pursuing solutions to simplify, standardize, and ensure scale and serviceability. So the question really becomes, what components are to be considered to deliver on such objectives? We've learned from our clients across many business segments and geographies that much of the key ingredients include high available, reliable technology and applications, integration that's less exposed to the users and more as part of the plumbing, and of course, any device anywhere connectivity. If we apply certain solutions that we've seen effective in delivering on these objectives, an example of how these can be achieved to applying those solutions that deliver monitoring and management capabilities, simplified collaboration interfaces, and then universal applications that are not limited to in-room technologies. And naturally, key to all of this is partnering with the right solution provider. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tim Rick, our SVP of Operations here at AVISPL, who's going to speak about some successful implementations within customer environments. Tim? Thanks, Joe. As Rob announced earlier, my name's Tim Rick, and I'm Senior Vice President of Service Operations at AVISPL. In the closing of Joe's presentation, you heard reference to enterprises seeking out solutions driving simplification, standardization, scalability, and serviceability. I will be carrying this theme forward as we look at key drivers in identifying and implementing these solutions. More specifically, I will tie these solutions back to the driving focal point for any transformation initiative, the user experience. The items highlighted on this slide lend themselves to simplification, standardization, and scalability, characteristics ultimately driving serviceability, which will be discussed on a subsequent slide. Through many customer engagements, I found these to be the key areas of consideration when operationalizing successful workplace transformation. The first point of engagement for user experience, and perhaps often the most frustrating, is the scheduling experience. Too often, disparate scheduling applications are necessary to consider all meeting elements. Streamlining the applications to enable integrated attendee 
technology, and concierge services scheduling saves time and reduces confusion and user frustration. Next, transformation stakeholders must recognize that room integration should not be considered an engineer's opportunity to impress with how much disparate technology can be integrated into a room. Rather, leverage the engagement as an opportunity to focus on the business needs of users and the simplest design solution to achieve those business needs. Over-engineered solutions are a common frustration encountered in today's workplace. Along with simplifying the in-room experience, ensure that users both inside and outside of the meeting room are able to enjoy similar meeting experiences. As one of the slides Joe highlighted earlier illustrated, 54% of meetings now include remote participants, and there's been an 80% increase in the mobile workforce since 2005. Remote meeting participants should be capable of representing their points of view as effectively as those who are able to attend locally. In addition to the aforementioned items, Successful workplace transformation incorporates a deliberate focus on ensuring an intuitive and consistent user interface across rooms and campuses. Consider enabling technologies such as one button to push to further simplify the user experience. Tying into this consideration is the follow-on requirement to ensure proper training and adoption programs are introduced. The ultimate goal for meeting room technology is to allow users to direct their attention to the purpose of the meeting, not the meeting room technology. The previous points highlighted key considerations for simplification, standardization, and scalability. Stakeholders must be careful when taking on transformation initiatives to not overlook the serviceability of the solutions being deployed. Serviceability should be a key design consideration, meaning architects of workplace transformation should understand not only the desired user experience, but also the desired service expectations for availability, on-site remediation, and advanced replacement of installed technology. Over the past five years, a lot has been said and done about integrating audiovisual and information technology platforms. While these efforts have yielded positive results in terms of technology integration, the maturity of the service programs behind each segment of technology has yet to catch up. As such, considering technologies from audiovisual manufacturers whose service programs are more progressive can assist in achieving serviceability goals and lessen total cost of ownership. In instances where advanced replacement programs may not be available, achieving standardization within the enterprise more easily enables customer-funded critical spares programs that can be implemented to augment manufacturer-sponsored warranty programs. Additionally, partnering with a sole source service provider who is considerate of both segments of collaboration technology and capable of delivering comprehensively to your national or global footprint will lend to a more accountable service program that can incorporate proactive remediation approaches such as global problem management. Finally, with collaboration technology becoming key to achieving business outcomes, it becomes critical to know that meeting room technologies are available. To enable this awareness, management solutions such as AVISPL's Symphony platform are available and can comprehensively monitor meeting devices, meeting quality, and meeting spaces. Dashboards for these applications can provide administrators with a global view of the enterprise and alert to issues before they impact meetings. Symphony's ability to schedule and manage conferences, integrate to third-party applications such as Exchange and Cisco Telepresence Management Suite, and automate the call launch process make it a powerful consideration for enterprises looking for solutions in this space. With all the aforementioned comments made, it's easy to understand why operationalizing a workplace transformation initiative can be an intimidating and costly expense for companies. To assist in this, transformation leaders must develop a formal approach and maintain discipline throughout the implementation. Through my experience, I found the following steps to be particularly effective. First, remain focused on the user experience. I've referenced it several times over my previous slides, but I want to again reinforce the importance of understanding your organization's desired user experience. Using this as the focal point of a transformation initiative is critical to success. With a desired state defined, companies must also recognize the current state. It is not uncommon for enterprise customers to have hundreds, if not thousands, of disparate rooms deployed which are not properly documented or enrolled in a technology refresh program. The attempted documentation of these spaces can often derail transformation initiatives before they even get started. One effective way AVISPL customers have collected this data includes the use of a meeting room technology inventory and assessment form. The goal here should be to understand the number of rooms deployed to key campuses, the core technology components installed, and the state of the technology. 
This information can then be aggregated through a SharePoint application or an inventory management application so that a formal refresh strategy can be constructed. With a better understanding of the desired and current states established, customers must then begin to identify the gaps between the two and develop a roadmap to refresh the meeting room te technologies with consideration of these gaps. Don't become overwhelmed by the magnitude of what needs to be accomplished. Instead, focus on developing the plan, identifying critical pain points, and driving tangible improvement. If there's not one already engaged in the transition process at this point, seek out a service provider that can add value by leveraging lessons learned from prior engagements. The service provider should be able to offer common room standard frameworks and have strategic relationships with the industry's leading manufacturers to assist you with this journey. Finally, develop objective ways of measuring success, whether it be through previously mentioned management applications like Symphony, customer satisfaction testing integrated into a meeting room's interface, or some other means. It's just as important for an organization to understand when the meeting environment produced a successful outcome as it is when it produces an unsuccessful outcome. Comparing the frequency of these two outcomes with a targeted meeting success rate service level is often a productive way of evaluating this. In closing, I'd like to offer a quick overview of a case study from one of AVISPL's customers. It's a Fortune 100 company with over 140,000 employees globally. This company's as-is technology estate consisted of regionally distributed, hardware-based infrastructure in nearly 4,000 technology-enabled rooms, with over 25% of these rooms being enabled with advanced collaboration tools. The customer aimed at reducing travel time and expense, but was hindered by the as-is technology estate. Specific challenges included cumbersome scheduling applications, disparate and difficult-to-use in-room technologies, and an ineffective collaboration solution for remote workers and out-of-network communications. Customer wanted to move to a more simplified, standardized, scalable, and serviceable solution. This included migration to a software-based infrastructure and management application coupled with a global refresh of advanced collaboration rooms with Cisco SX and MX technologies and last-mile audiovisual integration. The deployed meeting room technologies have a consistent user interface and are accessible for users to reserve through a self-service integrated scheduling platform or through AVISPL's global conference operations team that provides reservation and concierge assistance. AVISPL's global network operations team leverages Symphony integrated to Cisco TMS through third-party API to deliver ongoing monitoring of infrastructure and meeting room technologies with a focus on ensuring minimal downtime and high availability of the technology environment. The outcome of this transition is a more consistent, reliable user experience that is focused on the core tenets of simplification, standardization, scalability, and serviceability. With that, Rob, I'm going to hand it back over to you. Okay, thank you, Joe and Tim. At this point, we'd like to take a minute to allow our audience to answer the second polling question. We'd like to know what is the biggest challenge you face in managing your meeting room technology. The answers are here on the screen. Please take a moment to provide your response. Simply use the mouse to click your answer that best suits your opinion. We'll be taking a look at the results of our polling questions in a minute, so please stay with us. At this time, I'd like to ask our audience to take a brief survey and evaluate this program. While you're providing your feedback, we'll be review reviewing the results from our poll questions and spend some time answering some of the questions that you've submitted during today's live program. Okay, so let's take a look at these results. I'm very interested to see them. So the first uh, question was, what technology do you plan to add to your meeting rooms in the next 6 to 12 months? This is an interesting mix here. Um, the first one indicates that uh, there's, there's an expansion of uh, rich media technology uh, into more meeting rooms. But the bottom two responses um, indicate to me that there's um, a strong demand for continued uh, ease of use and management and control over the meetings uh, with, for example, touch screen control systems and uh, scheduling integration with calendars. So that's uh, very um, interesting to see and it does match up with our research. Thank you for answering that one. Let's take a look at our uh, second poll question. 
I'm always interested to see what the challenges are out there because a lot of times we, we hear the feel-good stories, um, but it's important to understand, you know, what the challenges are so that you can effectively um, tackle those. What's the biggest challenge you face in managing your room technology? Lack of standardization. That's not really a surprise there. A lot of organizations build their solutions over time uh, based on different requirements or through uh, merger and acquisition. Um, let's see here. Interop challenges associated with multi-vendor collaboration. I think that's uh, directly correlated with the first one. So um, it's interesting that there's more recognition about the interop challenges rather than um, the underlying standardization issues that may be causing those interop challenges. Um, too much time for IT to uh, retain and maintain the solution. Um, that's something that uh, we see, but um, that's actually in decline with the rise of uh, more advanced services that might be um, higher touch behind the scenes or lower touch due to uh, more reliable and uh, easier to use technology. Um, no challenges. There's an interesting one. I'd like to speak with this company that, uh, or the companies that have uh, answered in such fashion. Um, thank you for replying to those polls. Um, it's time to move on to our Q&A. Um, I'm going to moderate this session, um, pitch the, the questions to Joe and Tim. So uh, please keep those questions coming in. And um, I will uh, try to answer um, some of the questions and, and give my two cents uh, where appropriate. Okay. Um, first question. Is all right. Now I see it in full. I'm sorry. I had to enlarge my screen. Uh, what do you recommend for companies looking to integrate Skype for Business on the desktop with other conferencing technologies like Cisco and Polycom in their meeting rooms? This is actually a frequently asked question. I'm going to start off uh, by passing this one to Joe for uh, some insight. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Uh, so it, this is a good question, right? Um, at the end of the day, uh, Microsoft certainly is on the scene um, in, inside the enterprise communities, and we, we see it often. Uh, but, uh, you know, the big challenge becomes interrupt, right? So it was interesting to see the poll questions uh, to, to highlight interrupt to be a challenge. So enter mm -hmm. Skype for business. Uh, that's very prevalent inside many enterprises. We use it here at AVISPL as well. Uh, and, and the need uh, to ultimately unify or um, it, you know, introduce uh, Skype for Business as a tool uh, to uh, interact with the likes of conference rooms with advanced collab tools and so on. Uh, the good news here is today there's actually real options. There's actually many of them out there. Uh, but if I were to boil it down to one simple response, the, the most ideal approach to achieving an integrated Skype for Business on the desktop with other technologies like Cisco and Polycom, as the question goes, into their meeting rooms is a proper VMR solution with federated Skype for Business. And, and it's not difficult to achieve. It absolutely works. We use it here. We support customers. Uh, that use it, but a proper VMR platform that permits not only internal conferencing, but also seamless business-to-business -business communications. So you can successfully, with the right VMR solution, ultimately use Skype for Business and dial out to virtual meeting rooms, even if it's external participants, not just internal communications. All that needs to happen there is a federation between your Skype for Business platform and other uh, and the VMR platform that, that you're ultimately employing. And by the way, AVISPL supports um, uh, VMR uh, very successfully these days. So that would be the answer. VMR ultimately is the right answer mm. to support Skype for Business Integration. Right, the virtual meeting room. Um, yeah. Yeah, Joe, and if I could just add one thing to that, right, you know, just to emphasize, I think, the, the core point there, and that, that's ultimately that enterprises don't need to abandon, um, you know, past investments and hardware-based endpoints 
to pursue initiatives for S for B. Right, as, as you called out, right, there are legitimate options available for interoperability between the two applications that can help environments pivot from, again, the more traditional hardware-based solutions uh, to, to more desktop-based solutions. Right. Uh, a lot of people don't actually realize that Skype for Business natively has some issues communicating with the outside world. So uh, some thinking around that needs to be taking place. Um, we have a couple of other um, questions coming in here. Uh, what is the ideal core technology? Um, what is the ideal core technology before implementing video collaboration? In other words, what is the foundation you need to have in place before going with uh, visual collaboration? Anyone want that one, uh, Joe or Tim? Yeah, I, I could start, and Tim could, could add perhaps. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, when we talk about core technology for successful video collaboration or conferencing, uh, we're, we're really talking about the appropriate infrastructure. Uh, you know, you could deploy um, the newest generation endpoints, for example, inside a conference room. You could deploy the appropriate applications for your users, but without the infrastructure to power it, um, you're, you're likely to not be very successful. So. Uh, when we talk infrastructure, supporting and powering video collaboration, you have to consider network, of course. And so mm -hmm. you have the appropriate network, you have the appropriate, um, uh, uh, you know, wide area and, and, and local area, uh, you know, support from a prioritization perspective. Video takes its real-time traffic and so on. Don't want to get too deep into that, but network's the first consideration. The second consideration is call control. Uh, so what ultimately is going to provide that video tone, just the way you have a phone and you need dial tone. So you need to consider whether you're going to use cloud or on-premise to support the appropriate dial tone ultimately for your video collaboration solutions. And then finally, there's, as Tim mentioned, user experience for things like scheduling you know, uh, the different inventory and, and capabilities to, for use in the user community. I very naturally use exchange to invite him to a meeting and we both ultimately meet wherever I suggested we do, whether it be physically or virtually. The, the second part of it, though, is what technologies might I be reserving to achieve that? Am, are we meeting on a virtual meeting room and dialing in from whatever device, or are we meeting in two different conference rooms that need to be scheduled and ultimately dialing each other or a meeting place? So ultimately, those are the three primary components. Naturally, there's all of the other things to support that environment, but the core technology required it, it involves networking, call control, and then, of course, your, your scheduling and, and, and conferencing uh, if there's multiple devices that, that need to connect. Mm -hmm. yeah, Thanks, and Joe. I, and I would, add that, yeah, I would add to that that those three items that Joe just alluded to ultimately drive not only deployment of video collaboration, but adoption of video collaboration, right? Because they're going to drive quality of experience, ease of use, and again, you've heard us kind of revert back to it time and time again. Um, they're going to help drive the desired user experience. So uh, you know, certainly the, the items that Joe's called out will help to drive high rates of adoption of video collaboration. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, the, the next question actually does have an implication on user experience. And um, since you have the mic, Tim, I'm going to ask it to you. Sure. Um, what's your opinion for using webcams in large conference rooms? And I assume those are some type of, of USB uh, device. Yeah, and again, it goes back to, from my perspective at least, it goes back to deciding what you want the user experience to be like. Obviously, there are some limiting factors associated with using uh, webcams in large conference rooms, the video quality uh, won't be as good as when you've got um, codec-specific or hardware-based specific um, products deployed. Um, you know, other, other complementary products such as uh, speaker track to complement uh, those, those, those uh, you know, better quality uh, imaging products uh, can help hone in on the speakers. Um, so, again, it goes back to the balance between user experience and, uh, and budget. Um, but certainly, if the budget would allow for it, the preference that ABISBL would set forward is that you know, users be considerate of some kind of camera technology that would 
allow greater focus and picture quality than perhaps a webcam would. Mm. Okay. Good. Um, questions are rolling in here. Thank you, everybody, for being interactive. Uh, Joe, I'm going to pick on you. Um, this should be an interesting answer. Which conferencing platform or service delivers the best experience across all modes, mobile, meeting room, and desktop? Yeah, this is an interesting one. Thanks, Rob. Um, you know, uh, here's the deal. So, so AVI SPL, we're, as I mentioned earlier, a technology service business. And uh, we, we, in the process, in, in, in being a trusted advisor to our clients, we don't favor, you know, one platform or another. We really do take an agnostic approach to ultimately understanding the user experience and the desired outcomes. That being said, um, if, if I were to look at um, so, some of the you know, key manufacturers, Microsoft, Cisco, Polycom, let's use them, in the space and what they've done to date to provide homogenous solutions that actually are you know, uh, you know, realizing some, some real successful deployments these days, uh, I would submit that they're all basically you know, even. Uh, the problem becomes it's homogenous, right? And so, uh, you know, who can afford to greenfield and forklift and just deploy all one uh, solution? Typically, there's mixed environments. And so, uh, this is interesting because it kind of goes back to my first response to Skype for Business and, 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 and starts to suggest, once again, a, a VMR type of approach. Why, you know, VMR might help with delivering a good user experience across all modes is because VMR is agnostic by nature. All it is is a conferencing platform such that multiple different devices can meet on and have a successful video, right. audio, web, you know, conference. Uh, so, you know, it also implies cloud. So at the end of the day, um, I think, you know, conferencing platform or service you know, measures across different modes to deliver a proper user experience needs to be considerate of some form of cloud uh, or hybrid of cloud to truly achieve uh, sort of any device type yeah. of experience for conferencing at this point. Right. I, I would agree with that because we see, you know, obviously different use cases and, and different preferences and different environments. Personally, from a device perspective, I prefer the desktop. You know, it is more personal uh, and, and usually more full feature than mobile. Whereas a, a room, sometimes, you know, in my preference, um, it feels like inclusive of the people that are sitting together. Uh, and sometimes, if it's not managed correctly, the, the people that are outside of that room, external parties or internal at other sites, may not feel like they're directly in that experience. So, I, for those reasons, I personally um, prefer. The PC where everyone's distributed, but I know that's not usually the case. And obviously, Joe, you would know from hands-on experience the uh, the challenges there of making all those different devices equal con uh, contributors to a meeting. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm, I'm, there's a question I'm going to demote, and we'll follow up on that later. Um, Tim, uh, do you offer service? Um, that assesses an organization's conferencing domain uh, and then help provide, you know, roadmaps? Because, you know, it's a, it's a very good question. How are things you, you buy today going to affect where you can go tomorrow? So what are the services that people need to be thinking about in terms of current and roadmap, and how are those provided? Yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. So um, ABISPL definitely does. Um, offer a service that supports those types of initiatives. You know, as evidenced a bit by uh, my segment of the presentation, you know, it's 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 definitely a consultative approach that we take with customers to first identify what is the as-is environment and what's the desired state, and then what are some of the potential solutions that exist out there and which would be most effective within their uh, their particular environment. Um, Joe, I don't know if you care to elaborate on any specific um, offerings that we have there uh, or approaches, but I'll, uh, I'll pass it over to you for further comment. Yeah, thanks, Tim. And, and you know, as you mentioned earlier, um, it's so critical to, you know, start uh, with the, the um, 
the desired outcome or user experience uh, as you endeavor upon assessing uh, a current organization's domain uh, and recommending a roadmap. And so that's what AVISPL ultimately does. Uh, it's a professional service that offers, uh, as Tim mentioned, a consultative approach, and the deliverable in that engagement ultimately provides a snapshot of the desired outcome and user experience at the very start, along with an as-is and gap analysis uh, to achieving uh, certain um, options uh, to, to achieve the, the outcome. And so, yes, we do offer a service. Uh, it's becoming um, more and more prevalent, frankly, in the process of the entire design-build engagement in the integration communities. Uh, and and ABISPL has ultimately made big investments to establish things like a good, strong Microsoft practice, a, um, a Cisco practice, a Polycom practice, and so on, so we can offer uh, a true agnostic uh, point of view um, that is neutral in the sense that it, 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 it accomplishes desired outcomes and user experiences and doesn't favor one technology or the other because at the end of the day, um, you're inevitably going to run into interop challenges. Right. So, so yeah. Right. Yeah, so, so you do need to actually map today and consider what that means tomorrow. I, you know, I have a question of my own, guys. Um, I, I was invited to participate in an immersive telepresence session. Um, but, you know, given my address, I was told that I needed to drive 15 miles away in a dense metropolitan area because there were a lot of rooms and endpoints that did not support SIP. Um, so wh what, would the, what would the advice be to companies that have um, legacy protocol um, investments? What should they do with those? Do they, do they drag those along? or should they try to integrate and, and bring them forward? Can I uh, – I'll, I'll ask for a volunteer for that response. Yeah, this is Joe, Rob. Uh, I can I, – I can, you know, I've, uh, I've recently been involved in a, in a fairly sizable uh, transition from an existing – from a very large – in fact, Tim spoke to it as one of our case studies – a very large customer – uh, that uh, seemingly has some challenges, right, because they have some legacy technology, not, not only at the endpoint level, but also at the infrastructure level and configuration right. level. And so they were kind of stuck with 323 dialing plans and, you know, can't, uh, you know, take advantage of some of the newest software-based, you know, infrastructure technologies as a result and had to consider going to SIP and so on. And uh, so I wanted to use that as the example to answer your question. The, the ultimate answer uh, that was arrived at for this particular enterprise, and again, it's, it's kind of an extreme example, but is to ultimately support both, right? So have backward compatibility, have, uh, you know, a 323 dial plan capability, but also introduce SIP as a capability that would permit them to do things like Skype for business integration, VMR capabilities from an internal perspective, simple B2B dialing, and so on and so forth. So uh, the net result is, um, you know, configuring their uh, new infrastructure to support both, interestingly enough. Right. You need okay. backward compatibility is the point. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, and I think if we reflect back on, on that first question that came up, and Joe spent a little bit of time talking about interoperability between Skype for Business with other conferencing technologies, you know, again, the, the, whole, the whole point to emphasize here is that there are options available for interoperability that can be pursued. Um, it's just a matter of understanding, you know, what, what technologies are within the customer's environment today, what, what their desires are for, uh, for roadmap and then how we, how we help bridge uh, the as-is state to the desired state. So, again, mm -hmm. definitely solutions that exist for interoperability. Right, right. Okay. Um, let's move on. Uh, audience question. Um, any idea of what percent of the industry is prepared for video collaboration solutions? That's, that's a good good question. There's a lot of you know, cultural and behavioral issues that might be a challenge. So do you, do you have any indication of, you know, who's ready for video? 
It, I, yeah, I can, uh, I can start sorry. with that. Go ahead, Tim. Yep. And no problem. So, um, you, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's an interesting one. It's an interesting question, uh, a difficult one to perhaps pinpoint um, the percentage of users who are actually ready for video collaboration. You know, Joe called out um, three tenants earlier that we thought were important before deploying video collaboration. Um, but ultimately, you know, a, a lot of it comes down to um, is, your, is your organization's culture ready to uh, embrace video as its preferred form of communication, right? So uh, we, we hear a lot from companies who want to save money on travel budgets and things of that nature. Um, but if you deploy video communications and don't motivate the employees, make it easy to use, et cetera, um, then you're going to have two streams of expense as opposed to one offsetting the other. So, you know, again, in terms of, in terms of what percentage of, of folks are actually ready for uh, video collaboration, it would be difficult to, to throw a, a yeah. flag at that. Um, but... Um, you know, again, I think the, the the baseline that Joe outlined for us earlier with regards to network call control and scheduling, uh, those those are absolutely the prerequisites to successful video collaboration. Yeah, yeah I, I would and, and I would add, hey, hey Rob, I, I would yeah. add to that real quick. Um, you know, here's a here's a different point of view associated with this question, right? Um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, we've talked in this industry for some time about the democratization of video, right, uh, in a sense that um, it is now ultimately an expected component of your collaboration tools and business, and even in our personal lives, in a sense that uh, things like consumer uh, solutions, Skype was one of them, but also FaceTime and things like this. So psychologically, I think, it's an expectation, the workforces and, and things that are ultimately beginning to, you know, shift and change. That being said, with the advent of things like, you know, native video communications, when I say native, using a browser because of web RTC protocol, I would submit everyone is ultimately prepared for video collaboration at this point, right? So web RTC browser-based video capabilities to ultimately meet point to point or dial into a meet me place has right. done it for us. That, that is what I think is one of the breakthrough developments in, in, the, in the video collaboration as an application space. Yeah, I think, I think those are all good comments. The other thing to, to consider also, you know, those, those types of, of technology evolutions help to overcome bad previous experiences for people that, you know, might be older in the workforce as well. Um, and, and I don't mean that in a, in a uh, derogatory way. But also the newer generation of workers are much more comfortable on video, with video in all forms. And I think that the um, applicability for them is, is definitely higher. And the... Um, uh, we'll just say the confidence to use it is definitely higher. So I think that the, the actual base of um, users that are willing to use it and will use it is certainly going to rise in the future as you talk about, you know, Gen uh, X and, and younger and moving into more prominent roles and becoming a larger part of the, uh, the workforce. Um, okay, that's uh, <laughs> enough of my, uh, my commentary there. Uh, let's ask what the uh, audience wants to hear about. Um, okay, this is, this is actually a question that is relevant to one of my slides that I showed on market share data, and I showed a, a growth in managed services. Um, the question is, among your current clients, what's the breakdown of remote versus on-site managed services, and do you see that shifting? In other words, you know, this is continuing to grow. How do you expect that to grow? Do you expect it to be on-site or remote? Um, Tim, I'll, I'll ask you that one. Yeah, sure. Good question. You know, certainly, um, you know, from an AVISPL perspective, we're seeing a shift in our, our customer base with movement more towards remote solutions as opposed to continuously adding on-site resources into the support environment. So there's 
There are scalability issues to consider there, as well as a lot of the other items that we've talked through on this call. So ABISPL certainly is seeing a requirement for both. Um, however, we're seeing the on-site component of it remain relatively flat while the remote portion of it continues to grow year over year as our customer base becomes more comfortable with reliance on cloud solutions and remote technical support that exists in the cloud to complement those solutions. So we're certainly seeing the two grow, um, you know, with the, with the remote portion more aggressively than the on-site portion. That's very helpful. I'm sure it's, it's helpful to the, uh, to the audience as well as for my research. I'm going to just uh, pause just for a second and go to my backup handset here. My battery is dying. Just a second, guys. Hello? Hi, guys. I'm back. Hey, Rob. Okay. Sorry about that. Hopefully everyone got a sip of water. Um, <laughs> that's the, uh, the problem with trying to use some old technology on my part uh, in my phone system here. <laughs> um, you know, I, I need, to, uh, need to wrap up in a minute here, but um, I, I wanted to ask uh, one more question of my own. And, and that is really, you know, having to do with what is happening with meeting spaces. I hear a lot about, um, you know, the conference room dying, which I personally don't agree with. But with, with the rise of um, solutions in office, like the open office concept, where there are fewer walls, lower cubes, or no cubes at all, um, we're seeing more small spaces for people when they need a quiet place to huddle, and so they call them huddle rooms. What are you seeing there, and what should be considered when, when trying to outfit those with AV solutions so that they can share in rich ways with, I don't know, colleagues or, or partners or customers that might not be local? You know, what, what, do you, what do they need to consider when outfitting those small spaces that may be formal or informal? Um, I'll, I'll pick on Joe last because I think I started with him, so. It makes sense to close the loop. Yeah, sure, and perhaps both Tim and I. I'm sure he'll have uh, he'll have an opinion on this too. But um, yeah, you know, it, I, I see this um, this movement and question uh, to be uh, prevalent and real in a sense that um, there is a, a need to answer your question directly for standardization. So uh, hmm. it's funny, you know, you know, we saw one of the poll questions come in and the majority answered lack of standardization to still be a challenge. Uh, with this shift and workplace transformation and all of the other characteristics that it's kind of taking on in a life of its own, millennials entering the workforce and so on, it, we, we as a company, ABISPL, are involved in it, see it, and we believe it to be real, Rob. Uh, and so mm -hmm. how, you know, we're accommodating that from an AV technology perspective, how we're helping customers transform from a collaboration technology perspective is ultimately starting to blur, right? So in the end, the, the answer is standardization, so critical to accommodate this shift. So the shift is on. It's real. Uh, to accommodate that shift and, and create for a successful environment that provides for the proper collaboration setting and tools, it's all about standardization. Believing mm -hmm. that the conference room is dead uh, is, from my perspective, not true. The conference room now is, is, is a blank canvas, right? It, it's become more than just a room inside one of the offices. The conference room is everywhere. Uh, so, at the end of the day, how do you accommodate wow. that? And that's where audio, visual, and collaboration technology tools come in. There will always be a need for those key components to successfully powering that environment. That's where system integration companies like AVISPL are focused to help accommodate this shift. Tim, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, you know, it, uh, 
th throughout, the, throughout our slides, we talked a lot about simplification, standardization, and scalability. And I think, Joe, you just emphasized the point there in response to Rob's question. I think what we're seeing amongst enterprises especially is not the death of the conference room, rather bringing the conference room in different forms to more, more of its users, right? So as opposed to 10 complex conference rooms that were perhaps over-engineered, now we're seeing 100 spaces that are integrated with technology that can be used by uh, everyday users. So um, we're certainly seeing, um, you know, these technologies be consumed on a much broader scale than we have in the past, and it's all based on you know, this, this recurring theme that we've promoted around standardizing and simplifying, ensuring that we can deliver to scale, and ensuring that we're considering service as the design consideration as we work to build out what our, what our desired state looks like. Okay. The conference room is everywhere, but we need to standardize and make sure it's interoperable. Uh, that, that is my key takeaway. Um, that's all the time we have for this portion of our Q&A. Um, but before closing, I'd like to remind all of today's registrants um, that you'll receive a $250 credit voucher to one of Frost & Sullivan's Mind Exchange executive events. Uh, you should check them out. They're very informative. Um, if you have submitted uh, any questions that we didn't get to answer or if you have any follow-up or new questions, um, please contact us, um, and we'll be contacting you for any questions that we didn't get to. Also, if you missed any part of this e-broadcast or you want to share it with others, um, an on-demand version will be available on our website at frost.com forward slash collaborative workflows. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. This was some really great information uh, shared by Joe and Tim. Um, at this time, um, we'll have to end our e-broadcast. I'd like to thank everyone again for joining us. This is Rob Arnold signing off.